All right, so thanks again for joining us. I'm gonna be the slideshow handler. I'm gonna hit the arrows and Lindsay's gonna do most of the talking. But I want to start with doing an introduction about myself and about the Maine Coalition Against Sexual Assault. So the Maine Coalition Against Sexual Assault does many things, um, but maybe the, the first thing Mikasa really took on was doing legislative work. So talking to the legislator about laws around sexual violence, supporting survivors, advocating for survivors in the legislature. And then we also do work with the sexual assault support centers around Maine. So throughout the counties in Maine, there's a sexual assault, sexual assault support center in every county. And those sexual assault support centers support survivors directly. Uh, and that looks like the helpline, our 1-800-871-7741 number, that is 24-7, and a survivor can call or anyone can call anytime and get support via the helpline, uh, whether that's just emotional support during that time or it's getting connected to services at the sexual assault support centers, services like accompaniments for safe exams after sexual violence or reporting to law enforcement or moving through the court process or getting a protection from abuse, kind of that case management stuff. And then also support groups and other healing modalities. We've done trauma-informed yoga. We do more traditional support groups, all different types of things. And those services um, are throughout the state. So wherever you are, you can get connected for sure. So that's a little bit about Mikasa and the sexual assault support centers throughout the state. And my name is Kenyon. I've worked at Mikasa for like three years now. Right now I'm the special projects coordinator and I take on small projects like this, like webinars and such. And with that, I'll let Lindsay introduce. Hi. Hello, thank you so much, Canyon. It's been really nice to work with you. Um, my name is Lindsay Piper. I'm a women's health nurse practitioner, um, and I like to use sexual um, health and reproductive health nurse practitioner because that kind of encompasses more of the work that I do. Um, I'm the lead clinician here at Maine Family Planning, and um, I provide abortions, and um, I help kind of guide the programming and um, kind of you know, direction that we're moving in um, as an abortion provider here in the state. And um, I do lots of outreach and education um, in addition to my clinical work and um, internal training. I've been um, a part of the abortion movement um, since I was um, a teenager and um, in this role as a provider for about um, 15 years. Um, but I, you know, had worked at feminist health centers and at different abortion um, um, abortion provider sites um, probably since my um, early 20s. I think my first job at an abortion clinic was when I was 21. Um, and I like to just make um, a side note of the reproductive justice lens. Um, well, it shouldn't, it's not the side note, it's sort of the main, the main note. Um, and, you know, I'm not going to talk a ton about this, but I would love for you all to sort of write down reproductive justice and then reproductive rights and note that they're um, different things. And so justice is definitely more of like a social justice, human rights um, versus just what's legal and not legal. Um, and, you know, broader than that. And it is, um, it's a lens that was developed by um, women of color um, who, um, you know, have done a lot of really important work. And so that when I, as a white person, am calling on this terminology. I just want to make note that it's not anything um, other than something that I believe in, but I haven't made large contributions in the way that um, these other activists have. Um, I do have a background in rape crisis work. Also, um, I have um, accompanied people to the hospital, to their court um, cases, to counseling visits, to you know different things like that. And so um, when Canyon reached out to me, it felt like a really nice way to kind of um, kind of loop back around to kind of the how I got into healthcare originally as a college student um, working at our um, rape crisis uh, counseling services um, at UNH. So um, next slide are, um, so I don't tend to read slides, um, you know, verbatim. And so I encourage people to take notes and write down questions. And I'll try to make this as active and interactive as possible, um, just so that people can stay um, 
on with me and you know feel like you're doing the learning that you want to do. Um, so this is kind of the overview of what the presentation will look like. Um, and then on the next slide, this gives an overview of our services at Maine Family Planning. So um, abortion, sexual and reproductive health care, the Reproductive Empowerment Project. Um, and I'll just speak very briefly, but people can fill in if I, if, if I misspeak, but um, folks go to um, places where there are populations that may not be able to access health care otherwise, like um, in um, like, a, I don't know, like encampments for unhoused people or um, different shelters or um, for programming for people who have um, been victims of trafficking and then they get to do remote visits um, with our providers and get testing and education um, and sexual and reproductive health information. Um, some of our sites offer primary care. We offer gender affirming hormone care. Um, we do outreach and education um, in schools and then in general um, to our legislature and to, um, you know, we're, we're working on a project doing outreach to emergency rooms. Um, and then we also have family support services like WIC. Um, and so that's kind of an overview. And, um, and then honing in on the next slide to our sexual and reproductive health services, more specifically, we provide contraception, pregnancy testing options, counseling, preconception counseling. IUI stands for intrauterine insemination. Um, we do vasectomies and yearly wellness visits, cancer screenings, um, abnormal pap follow-up. Um, gynecologic visits um, broadly, and then STI testing and treatment, and then PrEP stands for um, pre-exposure uh, prevention, um, and so we treat um, folks who are at higher risk for contracting HIV as well. Um, so next slide, um, this is our um, newly developed mission, um, and I really like this because it talks about um, making this accessible to um, the people in our state. And, um, you know, it's not as specific to like preventing unplanned pregnancies, et cetera, whereas that used to be sort of like the, the line. And this is more, um, I guess, up to date and relevant. And then on the next slide, um, this is our vision, which is a much broader, um, you know, human right to bodily autonomy. And, um, you know, I think that in that way, abortion and, um, you know, bodily autonomy with whether or not you want to, you know, be intimate with somebody. I think those are sort of like things that can't be extracted from each other. Um, so next slide. And then I just like, um, these are the different items of what we believe. In a, I don't know if you're in the way on my slide, but um, collective power, um, diversity, equity, inclusion, um, sexual and reproductive rights of human rights. And um, we believe in dignity regardless of somebody's financial status and et cetera. So these are things that you can find on our website, but I just wanted to give you an overview of who we are as an organization. Um, and so on the next slide, I'm gonna jump right into what is an abortion? So an abortion just means that it's the end of a pregnancy and it can be induced um, or it can be spontaneous. And um, an induced abortion is what we would do either here in the clinic or provide people with medications and then they can um, have their abortion um, where it makes the most sense for them to do so. Uh, most people choose in their home. Well, some people go to their relative's home, et cetera. And then a spontaneous abortion is just sort of the medical way that we say miscarriage. But nowadays we're leaning more towards early pregnancy loss. Um, although it's not inappropriate to say miscarriage, it just um, you know kind of describes it even um, more uh, as to what is actually is happening. Um, so next slide. Um, the Guttmacher Institute is an excellent uh, research institute and it has the latest up-to-date you know, stats of this, that, and the other thing. And them and the Society for Family Planning are really um, excellent resources in this movement to kind of keep us up to date with what um, the climate looks like across the country as far as abortion, contraception, and other um, sexual and reproductive health. Um, so I just wanted to, and this is by no means an exhaustive list, um, so that's why I put the facts link at the bottom if you really wanted to kind of take a look and see a broader view of some of these kind of these points about abortion. Um, one thing that's important to note is that um, medication abortion versus procedural um, is 
sort of taking over and we're seeing most of the abortions that are done here in the US are medication abortion now. Um, and so that means that most people are doing self-managed abortion in the home, in their home. Um, and then I also wanted to point out that um, a quarter of the people who can become pregnant um, will have had an abortion by the age of 45. And so it's just such a common experience that um, I think, you know, working hard to demystify it so that we can all sort of just have more of a common dialogue about the fact that this is something that's part of probably most of our lives, even if it's just somebody that we know or, you know, and they may not feel like they can talk about it because these numbers aren't available to us publicly, that it is just so common. Um, and I really like um, the thought that um, people seeking abortion also are people who have given birth or who will give birth. And it's sort of like takes away that, I mean, some people who have abortion never do give birth and that's also fine. But I think that a lot of people sort of don't think about the different ways that people may use their uterus throughout their lives. Um, and so that's just something that we as um, providers hold really um you know tenderly is that sometimes somebody has this journey with their uterus and sometimes it's this journey so um next slide so my colleague tracy i told her i would give her a shout out but she put this slide together for me um so the patient um is forwarded to our center for reproductive health line um and they connect with a specialist or they speak with somebody at the call center um, and some of their staff are trained to schedule for us directly um, or um, you know, make a case for the CRH staff to pick up um, and then it can go to voicemail. The patient is instructed to leave the voicemail with their name, date of birth, phone number, and they'll get a call back. And our team responds to voicemails throughout the day. Um, and usually a patient can expect it to get a call back by that same day. Um, if a patient wants a benefits check done before the appointment that, you know, there's a dis discussion about insurance versus whether they're using out of pocket money or whether they're using um, grant funding. And so, um, you know, we get that squared away before their appointment. And then if the patient is paying out of pocket, the full fee is $500. And then um, if um, grant funding is needed, um, we discuss that to help offset the cost. Um, and then the staff reviews this information and based on the patient's choices and screening questions, the patient can then be scheduled for either a medication abortion or an aspiration abortion. Um, and then sometimes based on their scheduling parameters um, and when a provider is available, they may be scheduled, um, you know, as far out as the following week. Um, but, you know, we try to schedule people um, at their nearest convenience. Um, and telehealth abortions are an option for people who fit the medical criteria. Um, so when you're talking to some of the clients that you're working with as their advocate, just that's another thing that is available um, potentially, if, if, like I said, if they fit the medical criteria. So um, that is how to schedule an abortion. So let's look at the next slide. And this describes what an aspiration abortion is. Um, so it's a one day visit and it can take up to four hours. Um, and um, the procedure itself is very short. And I've highlighted these items um, because when talking to somebody, especially if they had a more recent um, sexual assault in experience or if they know that they have a lot of trauma that they carry with them these are some of the things that might be really weighing on them and causing a lot of anxiety so um, this is a just a very simple description of what that procedure looks like um, and this is also available on our website um, but i wanted to highlight those items that um, people wonder about and often um, have questions about and so um, the procedure itself is very short and um, it's very normal to have you know, I, I worked with somebody a long time and she said, you're going to have wicked bad cramps. And uh, I thought, you know, she was speaking to her Vayner population. And, um, you know, I think with either abortion, um, heavy cramping is to be expected. And it just really depends on um, the patient as to what that feels like for them. And um, all right, so let's go to the next slide um, where we're talking about medication abortion. So um, this is a series of pills that people take, um, and we are able to provide this for people who are up to 11 weeks. And I should note just 
pausing for a second, um, aspiration abortion here in the clinic. Um, currently, we provide that for folks who are up to 14 weeks. Um, okay, so back to medication abortion. The two medications we use are mifepristone, which ends the pregnancy. Mesoprostol helps the body expel the pregnancy. Um, and we can see these patients in clinic. We can do telehealth visits. Um, and we can mail pills to people if they choose that, or they can go to one of our 18 clinic sites and pick up their pills. Um, and I highlighted the section I feel like that's most important um, here. The bleeding and the cramping with the medication is definitely heavier than a period and can last for several hours. And our staff is very supportive and there with tons and tons of education, information, support, and making sure the patients leave knowing and having a pretty good sense of what's going to happen for them during their abortion. Um, so that when they're having a self-managed abortion at home, they don't feel scared and lost, et cetera. And it's okay if they do, and then they can reach out to us because we have somebody on call 24 hours um, in order to support our patients, answer questions. And then if there is something that seems um, a little off medically, then we can assess them. So next slide. Um, this talks about how we help a patient prepare um, for their appointment. And so this is um, via a phone call when we do check-ins to, you know, remember for your appointment to come in at 8.30 tomorrow, et cetera, et cetera. So we have people not take drugs or alcohol that could impair their ability to consent. Um, and we suggest that 24 hours before the appointment, um, making sure that they've figured out their finances and any assistance before coming to the appointment. And if the time comes and they don't feel like they have the right answer, then you know we make sure that they have the phone number to call us to do so. Um, and if somebody arrives without the correct amount of money, it may be that we can't help them that day and would have to reschedule. So we want to make sure that's squared away for people um, before they arrive. Um, we tell people at this time right now, um, they can eat and drink before their appointment. We have snacks available um, for people, um, but kind of just conduct your day as you would. And I think especially during a procedure, um, and I say this to my patients who are getting IUDs as well, and very many people forget, please eat your breakfast before you come because putting in an IUD on somebody with an empty stomach can cause a lot more nausea and just like not good feelings. Um, so um, we encourage people to have a regular breakfast before they arrive. Um, make sure that they arrive on time. They don't need to get here early. Um, you know, we have things well scheduled to keep with the proper flow of the day. Um, and we have people um, bring a photo ID and bring a book um, and don't, you know, bring in your backpack, purse, camera, electronic equipment, et cetera, et cetera. Keep those things locked in your car. Um, you know, because we do, of course, in this day and age have security concerns. And so, um, you know, people can bring in their wallet and their iPhone or whatever kind of phone they have. And, um, you know, but not like a big bulky backpack. Um, and um, let's see, we, we do have people turn off their cell phone in the clinic area and we definitely don't want any photos or video recording in our clinics. Um, and, you know, and I'm not saying this necessarily to take away like power from a patient, but maybe to give the patient the reassurance that nobody else will be doing that um, on site when they arrive for their confidential appointment. Um, so um, we don't have Wi-Fi in our clinics um, and please don't bring any weapons into the clinic. Um, and so um, we do also make note that if somebody's coming for an aspiration procedure, they're gonna be here for about two to four hours. Um, and um, we are talking about having a support person. Um, and so it's okay to bring a support person um, and support people don't go into the procedure or recovery room, but we'll talk a little bit about where the support person can be present. Um, and then um, the um, staff here is very well trained um, for supporting somebody through their procedure. Um, and again, th that's kind of the, the main gig here, what we're gonna talk about for the rest of this. Um, and let's see, making sure you dress comfortably, um, you know, you don't have to bring pads. We have um, items to help with bleeding after that. Um, and then making sure at home, um, you know, think about what you want for self-care. I always ask people what their favorite ice cream is, if they're ice cream eaters, um, you know, what they're gonna watch on Netflix. Make sure you have the pads and the tampons and the ibuprofen and the Tylenol that you need, a heating pad. Um, having a thermometer is good. Um, and then just kind of, any other sort of like self-care items that you think that you would want to have available to you when you arrive home. 
So next slide. Um, here's what the day of the appointment looks like. Yeah, so you'll check in or um, over telehealth and making sure payment happens, finish some paperwork, you'll do your intake, medical history, and then um, we do a, a large amount of education, what to expect, either with your procedural or your medication abortion, and whether or not an ultrasound is indicated um, that will happen that day. Um, and then when you meet with the provider, this is when the informed consent happens. Um, and we will order labs um, as indicated medically. So this is kind of an overview of what to what the day of your abortion appointment might look like. Um, and it would be very different if you're coming in for a procedural abortion than if you're staying at home doing a telehealth medication abortion visit. Um, but I think when we do intakes and guiding patients through the process, um, they have a pretty good idea of what to expect when they are finally in their quote unquote abortion appointment. Um, so next page, please. Um, so now we're going into what it, yeah, yep, so trauma. So this is directly from the National Abortion Federation um, Trauma-Informed Abortion Care Webinar. And so trauma is the effect, the damaging effect that we experience when a series of events um, or an event um, affects our ability to cope. And so um, next slide, trauma-informed care. Um, it has these principles. And so, um, you know, we need to understand and recognize, respond. You don't, the patient doesn't need to disclose trauma in order for us to treat the symptoms. Um, and then we need to apply um, certain principles. But when I, I want to go back real quick to um, all types of trauma, um, thinking about things, not only sexual trauma, but, um, you know, growing up in a traumatic household or, um, you know, like a Hurricane Katrina or, you know, those kind of things. Um, and if we can, you know, maybe just think for a moment of different groups that might be at higher risk. I know that a lot of us have had training in this area, so we could probably come up with a pretty good list. Feel free to unmute and kind of say your ideas. You know, I'm going to just stop sharing for a second because I've got to put some uh, guides in the chat box for you to check out as well. Oh, yeah, I think I sent that to you in the email. Do you have it? Awesome. Thank you. Um, well, be thinking about there. I, I imagine that we could come up with different populations um, of patients that might be at higher risk for trauma. Um, but the idea is that regardless of the patient type, um, we have to approach all of the patients as if they've experienced trauma. Um, and we can talk to them about how stress and trauma um, can impact mental and physical health, or that's something that we should all be keeping in mind um, and talk about with our staff. Um, you know, I think using open-ended questions um, when you talk to your patients um, can ensure that we're doing a patient-centered communication approach. And then, um, you know, referring patients to trauma informed providers when possible. Um, I think that's something that isn't necessarily talked about as much, but we need to be diligent about our own professional self care um, and watch for signs of vicarious trauma. And that's something that I think, um, especially in the abortion movement, um, and that I imagine that you talk about with the staff that you work with, Canyon, is that um, we really need to um, just really take that very seriously because. Patients come to us with pretty hard stories. Um, and then also we see across the news, across the social media, across everywhere that um, the type of work that we do is under attack and vilified, even if, um, as you know, that you know more than half the country really, really needs this care. Um, and so just um, keeping in mind that. Um, and then I think things that you can do, like making small changes to language or behavior that increases patient comfort, well-being, and um, giving them back some of the control during the visit um, can help reduce re-traumatization. Um, so the six principles that establish trust and empower patients are safety, trustworthiness, transparency, peer support, collaboration or mutuality, empowerment, voice and choice, and then having um, an eye on cultural and historic and gender issues. So these are things that um, are important for us all to keep in mind um, when we're 
aiming to deliver trauma-informed care. And then um, the before, during, and after roadmap is something that I'll elaborate on um, a little bit as we go down. And what I will say is when somebody does disclose um, a trauma to you, I think pause, take the space, validate and acknowledge that they have, thank them for their trust and just hold that space for them and then provide them with empathy. Um, and, you know, this is a very much of an overview and it's, you know, it's a lot more um, broad than this, but next slide here. Um, so this is the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, the four R's of trauma-informed care. And for those of you who really like, um, you know, easy language things or visuals, I, I really like this because it um, talks about realizing the impact, um, recognizing signs, responding um, to the trauma, and then resisting re-traumatization. So, Next slide. Um, so I like, so this is like the before, during, and after of trauma-informed care. So checking in with a patient about their visit goals um, and then reviewing the components of their of the exam. You know, this is what I'll do to check this. This is what I'll do to check that. Um, you know, I like to remind patients, well, you're, it's your body. This is your visit. And you're in control. If you need to pause, if you need to, you know, stop and reschedule, um, you know, giving people that sort of choice, um, you know, during, in the beginning of the visit. And then um, I, I like to ask patients, have you had any past experiences um, that would help me make this better for you? Um, because I'm going in with the assumption that everybody brings some trauma to um, a medical visit. And let's be honest, who has made it to, you know, this age in this world without having had that experience, um, even a little bit. So I'm um, just kind of holding space for patients in that way. And then even just pointing out um, saying, oh, you seem a little bit anxious. Is there, you know, and kind of like pointing that out to a patient so that they don't have to try to hold it together and like pretend that they're not anxious the whole time they're being anxious, um, I think can really go a long way um, for helping somebody at least feel like their healthcare provider is paying attention to them and, and caring about the small ways that they're communicating what's happening for them. Um, next slide. So re-traumatization. Um, and I just kind of put in a little list of things that may, um, may re-trigger somebody or reactivate somebody. Um, and these are things that can certainly happen in a medical visit. And so I thought that advocates could be um, really mindful of this potential for re-traumatization um, and help the patient prepare for a visit by asking them what they think about this idea. And my suggestion would be, you don't tell them that this is going to happen because it very well may not. You know, what if they come in and they're having a great day and nothing happens? But I think just having this conversation beforehand so that somebody might be prepared. And then I would say that our staff is trained and works really hard to help minimize this from happening. Um, and then if somebody does have something that it feels very activating for them um, and they feel all right with the advocate sharing it or sharing it themselves with us, then that can be very helpful to us as a staff if there are particular things that um, are known that would be part, kind of activating for somebody in their visit. Um, so next slide. So during the visit, um, you know, constant communication about what's happening um, so the patient isn't ever like surprised um, that you're gonna, now I'm gonna touch, you'll feel my hand on the outside. You know, getting permission throughout the exam. Um, is it all right if I begin the exam? Do you mind if I do this part, that part, you know, those kind of things. Um, so that the patient has ways of being, um, you know, the driver um, throughout the visit. Um, and then, you know, allowing them to be in as much control as possible. And I say that, um, and I don't take that lightly, but I do say that for like, if I'm in a particular portion of like an aspiration abortion, um, it is, it would be pretty medically unsafe for me not to complete the thing that I'm doing. It, um, and so there are many points throughout even an aspiration abortion procedure that you could stop if the patient really wanted to, you to. And I've definitely discharged patients with multiple, multiple warnings of signs, symptoms, et cetera, et cetera, you know, with an incomplete abortion. Um, but there are certainly some points where it just would be a really unwise choice for a provider to stop um, the abortion. And so that's not so common that, that we're, we don't find ourselves in this occasion all of the time. Um, but I've definitely had occurrences where that's been the case. And um, then, of course, I would have to do some pretty big 
self-care for vicarious trauma, knowing that I was inside of somebody's activated state, um, trying to help them with the thing that they very much wanted and needed me to do. Um, and then we're kind of in the trauma response. Um, and so I think thinking about avoiding triggering words and phrases. So um, one thing I can think about is like um, when people are getting an ultrasound, um, we don't say, all right, now spread your legs. Just don't say that. Don't even say open your legs. I think we try in the NAF module says, push your knees out to my hands because that's very active for the person on the table. Um, and it's not like even saying flop your knees out to my hands, which is kind of still passive. And so it's even thinking about that kind of stuff. Um, and, um, you know, using the word foot rests um, instead of stirrups, you know, those kind of words can be a little bit funny for people. Um, and, you know, there's even a way of having patients tilt their pelvis down as far as possible um, to make the placement of the speculum less traumatic. Um, and so, you know, that's something that I use generally when I'm doing a pap test or inserting an IUD, but certainly with um, abortion care. Um, and it, you know, it's just a very particular way that you help somebody tilt their pelvis. Um, and, you know, so I think just even thinking about patient positioning um, can be helpful. Um, and then, uh, you know, whenever I get somebody set up and they're scooted down and I put the speculum in, you know, and I look up and I try to make eye contact with the patient, I say, are you doing okay up there? You know, because I'm down here in this very private area and you're way up there and I like to have eye contact and check in. Like, I'm a human taking care of you, who's a human, here we are together, you know, in this position you know, liking to just check in. And so I check in if people are doing okay, if they need a pause, if they need a break. And if people are giving me those sort of like um, body signals, you know, definitely noting, hey, do you need a break? Okay, next. So trauma-informed abortion care. Um, so I like the thought of th thinking about it as um, universal precautions. So we just use universal precautions when we glove up with all of our patients because we just assume everybody has something that could make us sick in that way, you know? And so in that sort of same way, we assume that everyone comes with some form of trauma. And I think in particular, when we're working with um, assigned female at birth, people in, growing up in a rape culture, that that carries um, some meaning. And so I think that we need to just note that um, even if somebody hasn't specifically been um, victimized themselves, the messaging all around. Um, definitely, um, I think, like I said, taking into account like power differentials and um, historical gender um, issues. Um, and then, you know, we always explain what the patient's going to expect. Um, that's part of our, um, why the visit is so long. Um, we definitely read our nonverbal cues. We, um, you know, give them choices throughout the visit. So it's very much, um, mirrors kind of what the trauma-informed care um, just general model is like. And this is what we do here at um, the Center for Reproductive Health. Next. So this visual was, um, I thought was very interesting. Um, it's the spectrum of trauma. And so people may experience just on a daily basis, um, misogyny, and very few people will experience torture. But most of us as humans will experience something along this spectrum of trauma. And I think that um, when we think about this, think about the privileges that you have, the different identities that you have, and where you might fall on this. And then think about things like power differentials between people who are learning from you, other staff members that you work with, especially providers. We carry a fair amount of power whether or not we deserve it, you know, um, just by our position. And so I think it's something that we need to think about all of the time and carry around with us. Um, and then certainly when it comes to interfacing with our patients, um, we carry just inherent power in this role. And so then I would also say that along, similar to the spectrum of trauma, there is a spectrum of perpetrating trauma. And healthcare providers need just to be aware that being in this position inherently puts us on that spectrum. Um, not because we're bad people, not because there's something that we're doing that's wrong, um, not because we don't care about our patients, but because that there's this power differential that exists. And so rather than like balking at that and saying, no, I, that's not me, just say, yes, you are correct. Now, how can I use my power responsibly and make it better for patients? So now we're on the next slide. 
So this is after an appointment. Um, so I like it when patients are able to get dressed after the exam part, so then we can regroup and talk about the plan, making sure that they know what the plan is, why we're ordering the tests we're ordering, what the timeline will be for getting their follow-up done, getting their results, um, making sure that we have their correct contact info. Um, and then I thought maybe um, either here, Canyon, or somewhere else that you would be able to share Mikasa resources here so that if somebody does dis disclose to us during um, one of our visits, we would have like a way to say, oh, and here's this resource we'd like to feed to you. Um, the thing about um, confirming with the patient their documentation preferences um, is that we want to make sure that um, if the patient would, you know, is would you like us to make note of this in your chart so that the next provider who takes care of you is aware that you've had this trauma? Um, and what can they do to help make you feel safe when you come and visit them? I also put in like if somebody prefers a size of speculum, um, like sometimes I'll use the pediatric speculum for certain patients and I'll make note of that so that my colleagues are aware that that's the speculum that needs to be used for that patient or other particulars with the exam. This patient needs an extra 25 minutes with every visit because X, Y, Z. And I see, you know, we give each other those notes. It's just a professional courtesy and it also helps patients feel welcomed in because then the provider's not like, oh my God, I had a 15 minute appointment. Well, this is, you know, it's already cushioned and the provider's like, okay, this is gonna, you know, it's gonna take some good amount of um, soothing on the patient to make this visit successful for everyone. So, yeah, I can add resources at the end um, and okay. give to the awesome links there. Awesome, thank you. Um, and then I, I just wanted to put a plug in for after an appointment, I think, um, whether it's the provider or if you're somebody's um, support person um, talking to patients, if they feel particularly activated at an appointment, what are some of the things they're gonna do um, to take care of themselves afterwards? Um, so the next slide here, um, gives us specific information, um, yep, about the logistics of um, going with somebody um, to their abortion appointment. So advocates um, are um, accompanying um, a, pa a patient and they're providing um, supportive companionship. And this is a service that they're providing. Um, and so, you know, um, is this, you added some notes here. I didn't know if you wanted to you speak on some of that there, Kenyon, about the um, safe accompaniments and whatnot, just say, using the same skills. Yeah, totally. Or legal accompaniment. Yeah, I can definitely chime in here. Uh, yeah, before I get too into it, I wanted to say something at the top that was, the reason we're even having this webinar is some of the directors got together when the Roe v. Wade stuff was going on and say like, how do we, support um, survivors, support people who need abortions. And this was one of them. And being able to go into a family planning service and support a survivor um, there, being in the waiting room, providing that companionship, and also all the things we talked about before, uh, with before the appointment and after the appointment. But this is not saying that um, every advocate out there needs to be doing this tomorrow. This is just having us like starting that conversation about uh, the ways we can be uh, more in a network of care, like I'm gonna be talking about later. There's so many people who need our services and need abortion services um, and being able to connect them when they want it, giving folks that option, giving them, them that information and resources is what we're starting and trying to get going today. Um, so that's why we're doing the webinar. And then talking about um, logistics for this, so that's so much of what advocates do when a survivor they're working with needs to go to the hospital for a forensic exam, or if they need to go to law enforcement to make a report, or if they need to go to the court, get a protection from abuse order, is giving people the information up front about this is kind of what you can expect, or this is who you can talk to, who knows what it's going to be like. And then so much of it is, yeah, companionship of being with someone while they're going through a really stressful time. So as much as advocates do when they're sitting next to someone who is telling a police officer their story um, and all the 
re-traumatization that can happen there, just being there is a huge part of it um, and talking about the next steps too and how they can support. So abortion uh, accompaniments are really not that much different in these ways. You'd be sitting in the waiting room. Um, you could be helping this person make that phone call and talking through what they need to know in that phone call. Um, but yeah, really it's the connections that are made. I know my, my colleague, Katie Condra often talks about how she spends most of her time in accompaniment talking about pets, you know, being in the waiting room, making connection with the survivor and making someone feel comfortable while they're doing this really hard thing. So that's all I wanted to add there. Thank you, Anya. So that that's a great, you know, lead into our next slide here, which we were gonna to try to have folks um, jump in again. Uh, I don't know if people try to post their answers in the chat, but if you go to the next slide, um, Canyon was gonna leave you in a brief exercise to see if there were different roles that people wanted to identify for our abortion specialists here, um, or if you're accompanying somebody. We have some answers for you, but we thought maybe we'd give you a chance first. Yeah, we can't give you all the answers right away. <laughs> We've definitely been talking a lot on our side of the house about the role of an advocate um, and definitely want to make sure we are not having anyone step out of their role or not taking on more than they can chew or um, folks not having to be the expert in the room because the abortion providers are the experts. So from the conversation we've been having today, yeah, wondering what you see as um, the separation of roles and what you might see as an advocate, like, hey, I'm going to really do this and let those folks do that. Um, and the same from, yeah, abortion providers. What do you see um, from what you've heard today about what advocates can do to support folks who are getting an abortion? You can type in the chat. You can unmute yourself. I'm going to leave some silence. So I like to read out what comes in the chat and Finn is talking about abortion specialists handle much of the screening for and education about medications or aspiration abortions for patients. Totally, yeah. What do we think for advocates? What, what could we see them doing? I think I shouldn't have told them that we already filled out all the answers. <laughs> totally. Yeah. I know folks sometimes <laughs> come to the webinar are doing more passive, um, but we love engagement here. So give some more silence. Going to keep reading the chat. Uh, during an education session, advocates could help patients think of questions to ask for sure, especially if having a trauma response and freezing. Definitely. These are, these are great. Emotional support and keeping them kind of grounded to what's like, grounded to what's going on without kind of getting lost in like uh, the rest of it, I think. Mm -hmm. So um, Lily said emotional support and helping keep them grounded mm -hmm. um, in what's happening so that they don't get lost. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. I don't know if that makes sense to us. Yeah, that's awesome. We got some more folks in the chat talking. Uh, Susan says we could help them look at the options and think what would work for their situation. It's a huge part of advocacy is talking through options. And then rape response services, talking about advocates could check for understanding. Did all that make sense to you? That's a great way to be checking in with that person, making sure they're able to make an informed decision. That's awesome. Thank and you. Yeah. Finn is talking about specialists are really good at talking through options, also especially because they have good info on what each entails, for sure. So let's look at our two lists. I was just looking at the time there, Canyon, and I wanted to... Oh, yeah. Sure. Let's, let's please do it. 
So okay. next, yeah, next slide. Um, so here are the answers. <laughs> um, so I'm wrong mouse here. Jeez. Um, yeah. So, mm -hmm. Yeah. Go ahead. I was just gonna chime in a little bit more. I think folks have talked about a lot of this. Um, connecting survivor to resources. It's, it's, what advocates do is connecting to all different resources and main family planning and abortion services are, are one of them. Um, and then helping people make informed decisions uh, by getting the information that they need and helping someone figure out what that information looks like. And then the self-care plan. Um, we've talked about this on our side of the house as safety planning before, but really going through and making a plan about before, during, and after. Um, like Lindsay talked about, like, what's that ice cream you like or what you're going to watch? But also, like, yeah, I think so sometimes we go too far into self-care, at least for us. So like, what are you going to do to take care of yourself? And, and thinking more of, like, community care of, like, who is around to take care of you? Um, mm -hmm. and, yeah. So on the next slide, um, one thing that I really wanted to just highlight um, is that... Um, you know, advocates need to think about these things for themselves. Um, what are some of their biases that they may have, values around abortion, and things that could be triggering or activating for them inside of a visit like this? Um, and so I think, you know, if you have to take a look at this stuff, it doesn't mean anything bad or wrong about you. It just means that you're being honest with yourself and um, responsible um, for taking a look at this before you then try to um, support somebody in this way. And so I think um, it's important for the people to examine their biases about abortion care and their values around abortion um, and assess their potential emotional reactions in that space um, so that they are able to bring, you know, show up for the client and provide the service that they've been asked to provide. Um, and one thing that we talked about early on, um, Candy and I, was that we, we wouldn't want to have an advocate show up and then become another patient. You know, like if they pass out or if they become particularly activated and and that doesn't, again, mean anything bad or wrong about that person. It just is something that um, people need to be mindful of and uh, make sure that they can kind of guard themselves against if they think that they would be particularly sensitive to it. Um, and, um, you know, I, I shared the anecdote about somebody, a patient in the middle of her abortion having a flashback. Um, and I was grateful that I had another abortion provider in the room who could then be right with the patient, kind of trying to, you know, support her through that while I was able to safely complete the procedure. Um, and then I was grateful to have her support afterwards because, you know, when we just talked about how traumatizing that was. Um, and then the patient was so grateful afterwards. She was like, thank you so much for helping me not be pregnant anymore. Even though in the middle, she was experiencing us as her, um, as her assailants. And that was really very traumatic for everybody. And then she also was so grateful at the end. And so um, just not all the stories are that dramatic. Very few of them are that dramatic, but um, just thinking about how seeing somebody in that state could struggling could activate you. Um, and then having your own self-care plan in place. And then um, I didn't tell her that I would shout out, um, but my colleague over here helped me come up with this beautiful list of what an abortion doula does. Thank you, Nikki. So next slide. Yeah, so, you know, and, and it's, it's all of these little things that are so important and huge when put together. And then just this bigger thing of holding space for the patient and making space for them to have their input about what they think would be helpful and allowing the patient to have their own experience of abortion because it's not going to be traumatic for everybody and that's not going to be a big deal for everybody and then it will for some folks and that's also okay and so not dictating what that space is going to be but just being there to hold it yeah and then you did talk about this. Um, I think this is really important. And I like the idea where you say community care. I wonder if you mind if I steal that and put that in my uh, slideshow from now on. Oh, for sure. Yeah, it's definitely not mine. There's a lot of people. Well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Candy cool. told me this is the way. <laughs> 
All right, we still got some time. I know that I had a question. Do we feel like we have time for questions, Lindsay? Yes, okay. So one of the things that um, sexual assault advocacy really focuses on is confidentiality. Um, and I just wanted to ask a question about that in terms of insurance. So we don't really deal with insurance. All our services are free. Um, but I think about people who might be on like family insurance who may not want the rest of their family to know that they had an abortion. Is there any workarounds with that? If you could talk more about that. Yes. Um, so we definitely see that. Um, and I mean, we have ways of working around it, including using funds and, um, you know, there, we can't ever guarantee that information won't be um, seeable by the insurance carrier, um, you know, and so we wouldn't ever want to make that promise to somebody. So if they were very concerned, if, if an abuser were a part of their insurance makeup or if a parent or, or, or something that needed them to not find out, then we may steer them more towards funding, um, like an abortion fund. Do, do people who do scheduling have any other thoughts about that? about how they kind of what they finagle Catherine or Biz or anybody. Did I answer it right? Uh, <laughs> mm -hmm. I didn't know if I didn't want to chime in if someone else was. Um, so yeah, basically, if there's concern, if they have a third party insurance, um, we would just offer them assistance through the safe fund um, for payment. If they um, have main care, main care has a little is a little more um, confidential, if you will, in the sense that they don't send EOBs home like third party insurance would. So um, people with confidentiality concerns, I'm thinking teens more than um, other types, but. Um, we have had in the past uh, build main care and been, they've, and it's been fine in the sense of confidentiality. Um, that's what I know. Cool. Thank you. Yeah, super helpful. Okay, other folks, what questions do you have? So we've got a couple minutes. And I'm happy to share my contact information too if people want to send questions. What is HT and DF? In more chat. Oh, that's from rape response services. Look. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, speaking to what's in the chat there just curious if we had someone that needed assistance and we for whatever reason weren't able to get full funds from the the safe fund that we normally pull from how would we get information on other funds like the human trafficking fund that i see listed here that's a great question We'd love to talk more about that. Uh, fortunately, I think oh. it will take us over time, but uh, the short answer one is- minute. And Susan's asking about parental knowledge. So we <laughs> have um, the um, Sexual Health Privacy Act here in Maine. And so um, there isn't a parental consent ruling um, for sexual and reproductive health services. But we do encourage you know, adult involvement when it's safe to do so, and that may be their healthcare provider. So, yeah. Lindsay, we, seems like a few more questions. Do you have extra time to talk uh, about? I'm, I'm fine, but people are welcome to disperse because I don't want to keep them past time, but I'm, I'll stick here for a bit, yeah. Great. Did that answer your question, Susan? Yes. Thank you. Product of conception. Okay, yes. Um, 
yes, we can we can collect it separately. Um, and that you know that would be, I mean, we would need releases and, and everything signed, but we can certainly set aside a POC um, if that were something that we were asked to do. Um, but I certainly wouldn't like make that decision. I would talk to my higher ups and you know ask legal and stuff like that about. But I know that they've fielded that before. Um, so it's certainly not possible. It's somebody's medical you know, it's their part of their body. So great. Yeah, and I'll just Catherine, and I'll just go a little bit into that. Uh, Maureen talked in the chat, but the sexual assault centers throughout Maine, throughout the state of Maine, <laughs> have access to that fund. Um, so getting whoever needs access to it connected with a sexual assault center. And the easiest way to do that is by calling the helpline, 1-800-871-7741. And I'll put uh, in the email out to everybody uh, flyers with that. And calling that helpline gets you connected to the center in your county. Um, and so once you're connected, you can talk with an advocate about needing access to that. Uh, and then with, there's some paperwork, but it, it usually goes fine. And uh, that's how you can get connected. But the, the phone number is like the uh, the way to get into everything else. Um, and I'll send a flyer. Let me know if you have any other questions on that. All right. Well, thank you all so much for being here. Um, Lindsay put her information in the chat. I'm going to follow up with stuff. It's been really lovely to spend time with all y'all. And I hope you have a great rest of your day. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, y'all.